My name is Alex Boucher, and I'm one of the co-hosts of this webinar. Um, I am the library liaison. I'm a research instruction librarian, and I'm the library liaison to the College of Human Environmental Sciences, the Department of History, Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx Studies. Um, and like Lance and Carly, I have helped faculty members around campus with systematic reviews, primarily helping faculty members in the College of Human Environmental Sciences. So Carly? Great, hi everyone. My name is Carly Reason and I am the library liaison to the social sciences. Um, and as Alex said, I've worked uh, with faculty and students across campus um, as they're working on um, conducting and just learning about systematic reviews. Thanks so much, Carly. And so my name is Lance Simpson. Um, I am the library liaison to the vast majority of the College of Engineering. Um, the only department uh, that's outside of my, my purview is the chemical and biological engineering. I'm also the liaison for the Department of Biological Sciences. Um, and I've done work with systematic reviews with the Transportation Institute, um, looking in engineering and some in public health as well. And I, I do have my email address down there below. Um, and many thanks to, to Alex and Carly. So to get us started today, um, and before we fully jump in, I'm gonna go through just a couple of quick, I, I know we, we all live in this Zoom world now. We, we've had a chance to try out some of these things, but I wanna make sure that you feel comfortable as we get started today. Um, so one, I want you to feel free to raise your virtual hand as we go through the, the day today. If you've not had a chance to do that before, there's a couple of different ways that you can. Um, if you're on a desktop or laptop computer, you can click the participants button down there at the very bottom of your screen. Um, and you'll see on the right side of your screen pop up a couple of options and one of them is the raise hand option. So if you do that, a tiny blue hand will appear on our screen and we'll be glad to answer that question for you. Um, the chat is open. So as we go through the day, if you'd like to, to ask questions through the chat, you can do that. I should note, um, I've got a, an image on the screen here that I'll describe for you for raising your hand if you are on a mobile device. So this will all look slightly different if you're on a mobile device today, but to, the way to get to that raise hand option on a mobile device is to tap your screen one time, and then you will see an option for more. And when you click that, that raised hand option will be there uh, for you to do that. Um, we do have the Zoom poll going. We're just about to wrap that up. So if you have, haven't had a chance, please feel free to answer that. So the question was, what is your familiarity with systematic reviews? Um, one last thing. So you may notice in the top left-hand corner of your screen that that beautiful red glowing blinking dot we are recording today's session. Um, if you do not want your image to appear on the recording, please feel free to, to have your camera turned off during the session today. Um, but we, we want to let everybody know that we're going to do that. We'll be glad to send you a copy of the recording once the session is, is completed um, later this week. And we'll also be glad to post this later to YouTube so you can have um, quick access to it. And any of your colleagues that weren't able to access that as well. All right, so as we go through too, I wanna make sure that everybody feels comfortable to ask questions. Um, we will have a couple of spots open for you to ask questions as we go. So I wanna start this out before we go any further in talking about systematic reviews and saying that we at UA Libraries are here for you. So no matter what part of the process um, with systematic reviews you're in, no matter how familiar you are with systematic reviews, we are happy to work with you. We have a team of liaisons that's glad to help you talk out any part of what it is that we talk about with you today and in the subsequent coming workshops. And we wanna make sure that you feel comfortable reaching out to us. We all have different subject areas of expertise, but we're happy to help you however is going to best work for you and the team that you are working with. Um, and with that, I'm gonna end our poll um, it looks like we, we had a, a, a great set. So we have about 32% of the participants that we've got are at the beginner level with systematic reviews. You're just getting started. So we're super excited to have you here with us today to talk about this. Um, uh, we have about 53% at the intermediate level. So you've started to learn about systematic reviews. You're starting to get comfortable, but you had a few more questions. And at our expert level, we have three folks in the audience that, that are, they're, they're feeling confident. They've done this before. They, they know what they're doing. So we're gonna be excited to share this with you today and to talk through, and I'm going to pass it on to Carly to get us started just after I've talked through what we're gonna to do today. So 
our, our setup for today, this, this is a lunch and learn style setup, so we're going to make sure to have you out by 1 o'clock. Um, we will talk about what a systematic review is. So for those of you that are just getting started, we've got you covered. Um, we're going to walk you through writing a research question, so getting started before you even do start looking for things for your systematic review. We're going to walk you through ser searching for other systematic reviews to give you good solid examples of other systematic reviews that may have been published already, or the protocols for a systematic review, or some that are in progress right now so you can see what other work is being done in the subject area that you're interested in. And last but most certainly not least, we will talk about creating a systematic review protocol, how to register that, and how to find others. So again, we'll have a couple of spots for questions open throughout the session today. Please feel free to, to, to stop us to ask those um, if you want to ask outside that se section as well. All right, and I'm going to pass it on over to Carly from there. Oh, I think I'll take this part. The, oh, as sorry, far as, Alex, yeah. <laughs> no, it's no problem. Um, so I thought what we could do is since we, we've looked at the poll and we definitely have some people that are relatively new to systematic reviews, I thought we would spend a couple of minutes just talking about what a systematic review is. And in the next slide, I'll sort of talk about how a systematic re review compares to a more traditional literature review. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the sections of this sort of definition of a systematic review. Um, there is a good general definition of a systematic review, which is that it is a review of the evidence on a clearly formulated question, which a clearly formulated research question, which is what Carly is going to be talking about in a little bit. Um, but based on a clearly formulated question that uses systematic and explicit methods to identify, select, and critically appraise relevant primary research, and then to extract and analyze data from the studies that are used in that systematic review. Um, what I will point out with these characteristics, what we will mainly be talking about in these three workshops that we have planned are, are the first three of these. Um, we will primarily be walking you through the research process of a systematic review. How to start and form a good answerable research question that you can base your review on. How you can design search strategies that are, well, systematic, but also reproducible. And then how to go ahead and do a systematic search that attempts to identify every published study that meets your review inclusion criteria. Um, we will not be talking a whole lot about the final two characteristics. After you have found all of the articles that you need to find for a systematic review, you of course then need to appraise the articles, um, decide, your team needs to decide whether they should be included or excluded based upon your predetermined criteria, and then you need to extract data and write the paper. We will mainly be walking you through the research process for doing a systematic review, setting up the study, finding all of the articles you need, and then managing your citations and sources. Another way of talking about what a systematic review is, is to compare it to a traditional, re traditional literature review. So Lance, if you don't mind going to the next slide. We have a, sort of a quick table that talks about some of the differences. Now this is a little text heavy and we are not going to sit here and read the whole thing and I don't expect you to read it. We will be sharing the recording of this with you and Lance is also sharing the slide. So you will have this if you want to go back to it. But I will point out some clear differences. Um, one, like I was saying, well, of course, you could start with a research question and a literature review, but a, but a clearly formulated research question is really the starting point for a systematic review. And like I said, Carly will be talking about that in a minute. But really, when you get into the next parts of this and where the clear differences are, in a literature review, you do not necessarily need to find all published studies on your topic. Uh, and a synthesis of important and current studies is usually fine. Um, but with the systematic review, it is really important and even imperative that you find all published research studies on your topic. Now, of course, there are 
there's criteria to that. You may not have to find all studies because you may be only looking for studies since 2010 or 2015. But within that time range, you are expected to find all published studies because to not do so would could invalidate the conclusions of your article. So for an example, I usually help out people in things like health science, nutrition, things like that. So if you're writing a systematic review on diabetes or COVID-19 or some aspect of each of those, if you were to miss published studies on those, your conclusions of your systematic review would definitely be invalidated or hurt pretty severely. So we will talk about search strategies. I don't want to make that sound daunting if you haven't done a systematic review before. We will help you with the search strategies that you need to be able to find all published articles on your topic. But we will be mostly doing that in next week's webinar. Today we're just sort of setting the foundations to some extent. Another thing you can do if you're a little bit worried about finding all published research studies on your topic is you can contact your liaison librarian. And like Lance said, we will be happy to do anything from consulting, which we could just help you build search strategies, choose relevant databases, or we could do more than that and we could really become part of the systematic review team. Um, the rest of this, like I said, we'll talk about in more depth as we go on, but those are sort of the important things I thought I would point out for those of y'all that do not have as much experience with working on a systematic review. So with that, I think we'll move on to the next slide, and I believe that will be Carly's turn. Yeah, great. So. Um, Another kind of way of looking at a systematic review is thinking about all the different steps. And this slide details very briefly all the different components of a systematic review. So first you are thinking about your research question and um, thinking about the different frameworks that exist that will help you construct, um, construct your research question. And then once you've uh, completed that step, you'll be thinking more about writing um, the protocol. And a systematic review protocol describes um, the rationale and the hypothesis and the planned methods of the review. And this is um, should be prepared before the review is started because it will really kind of guide um, your entire review. And then once you get that in place, you'll begin conducting your literature search and identifying the databases you want to search in and constructing your search strings and um, creating a search that can be both documented and duplicated. And then you'll begin selecting your sources based on the inclusion and exclusion criteria that you developed in your protocol. And then once you've kind of gathered all of your sources, the next step will be reviewing those sources to ensure that they meet the criteria that you developed in your protocol and that they're not duplicate records. And then the last step will be, um, you know, following reporting guidelines and, and writing out your systematic review for publication. And you'll notice the first two um, entries of this process or this, you know, components of a systematic review, they're italicized because those are the two that we're really talking about today. And this framework and this, these different components, we'll be talking about most all of these except for the very last one throughout this workshop series. So, um, then in thinking about with uh, the kind of the first step, um, if we can move to that next slide. Thanks, uh, thanks Lance. Um, so first off is, is writing the research question. And there are many different frameworks that exist that will help you write out your research question. And these frameworks, they really vary depending on topic or discipline or the type of question. Um, and these frameworks will help you write a clear and specific question. They'll help ensure that the question is appropriate and manageable in terms of scope. Um, and they'll provide detail on your, your study's objective. And they'll also help you um, begin to determine the inclusion and exclusion criteria of your study. Um, so there are quite a few that exist. I'm gonna talk just about three. Um, three of kind of the most commonly used frameworks. And that first one um, is called PICO. And 
This is a framework that's often used with um, quantitative research. And PICO stands for patient, population, or problem, intervention, comparison, outcome. And sometimes um, PICO can include time or a type of study. So below that is an example of um, a research question that's written following the PICO format. And you can see I've put in bold um, the different components of the PICO framework. And there are a lot of, there are quite a few examples of, of uh, questions that are written in these different formats. This, the questions I'm using today um, are from Cornell University Library and they put together quite a detailed page um, about these different frameworks and that that resource um, is is at the end of this presentation if you want to take a look at that further. Um, so the next example that we have is also called PICO but it's uh, PIC and then a lowercase o and this framework is often used with qualitative research and so PICO in this in this example stands for patient population or problem interest and context. And again, we have another question here at the bottom um, that's written in the framework of PICO um, directed for that qualitative, qualitative research. And then we have a third example, and this one is called SPIDER. And this, this framework is uh, often used with qualitative and mixed methods research. And I believe SPIDER was adapted from the first PICO example that we saw when kind of thinking about how we can develop a framework for um, more for uh, qualitative research and mixed methods research. So SPIDER stands for Sample, uh, Phenomenon of Interest, Design, Evaluation, and Research Type. And again, there's another example here at the bottom of the screen um, and you can see how, when you're writing your research question, how kind of having information that addresses each one of these pieces of the framework and that can really help you when you're constructing the question. And this is an example as well where you don't have to write out your question in the order of writing the sample and then the phenomenon of interest and then the design, as long as your question is kind of addressing these various components of the framework, um, it will help you um, move forward and really help you um, put together that question that, that is appropriate in scope and kind of gives you um, a more clear direction of where your research is going. And so these, these, again, these are just three, um, three different frameworks that you can use. And, and this, this image here uh, is from a book called Assembling the Pieces of a Systematic Review, a Guide for Librarians. And uh, there's two, two authors, Margaret Foster and Sarah Jewell, they published a book. Uh, they published this book and um, they have this, this page is a, a really fantastic kind of example of how many different frameworks there are for constructing your questions. Um, and you can see that they have the framework, what it stands for, as well as um, discipline or type of questions that these frameworks might work well with. And then there's um, kind of like an in-text citation next to the framework. And these will, uh, there's not a link on here, but if you uh, look at the, take a look at the book, these are authors that have written about these, these frameworks and provide you more information and more background about these different frameworks. Our library, we do have the ebook of where this, um, this uh, table is coming from. And again, the citation for this book, uh, the full citation is at the end of uh, this presentation, but I would encourage you to take a look and kind of see, you know, when you're form formulating your question, like what framework might work best and um, kind of explore through some of these, but their frameworks are a really good um, starting point and will be really helpful when you're constructing uh, that research question, which is the first step of your systematic review. So, um, you know, we've, we've kind of talked quite a bit so far about kind of what a systematic review is, how it differs from a literature review. Um, we've talked about some of the different steps as well as really focusing on that first step, writing that research question. Do any of you have any questions at this point about anything we've covered 
Um, and if you have a question, feel free to unmute your mic. If you'd rather type your question in the chat box, that's fine too. Like none so far. Oh, okay. Thanks, Alex. I just went ahead and posted a link to that ebook that Carly was talking about, the pieces of systematic review. I posted it into the chat. So if anyone is interested in looking at that, you could just go ahead and follow that link. Thanks, Alex. All right, all. we're not seeing any questions right now. We'll, we'll keep going from there. So I wanna talk about getting started with your systematic review and kind of searching some out. So if you've never seen a systematic review, you've never been a part of one before, had a chance to read through any, um, there's some great resources out there. Also, if you are wanting to see what other people are working on right now to see, see what systematic reviews may be in progress, um, we're going to talk about a few of those as well. So first of all, I want to talk about registered systematic reviews or protocols. And we'll talk about developing that protocol um, just after this with, with Alex. But um, the, there's a couple of things that I have listed here. So I've got the, the slide deck there. All of these are linked. So you're welcome to, to go and check any of these out after the presentation's over. Um, but the first one that I want to talk about, or the, the first three, I should say, are specifically for Focus toward health field, so they, they have a, a, a health bent to what it is that they are they're working toward. Um, the first one is the Cochrane Library. So the Cochrane Library allows you, they, they are the, the, the gold standard at, at taking a look and ensuring that systematic reviews are, are as effective and tight and, and following the, the scientific scientific method as they can possibly be. Um, Cochrane Library search link that I've got there allows you to search for other systematic reviews that have been registered um, by MeSH terms. So those of you that are familiar with PubMed um, may, may know MeSH terms, so they're the subject criteria. Um, you just heard Carly talk a little bit about the PICO setup. So Cochrane Library is actually beta testing a PICO search now, so you can look for these specific variables through Cochrane Library to see what other, what other systematic reviews may be out there that have used similar variables. Um, Cochrane Library provides these um, through Wiley, uh, Wiley and Sons, the publishing company, so you can create an account and actually be able to save your search results as you go through. So if you have something that you're interested in and coming back and seeing what results are available, you can do that by creating an account using your UA email address. Um, the next one I want to talk about, I've actually got an image of on the screen, and I'll describe that image for you in just a moment, is Prospero. So Prospero is from the National Institute of Health Research um, in the UK. Um, Pr Prospero is a place that you can register a protocol or a systematic review that is in progress. You can update at what stage you are with that review. And that way you can let folks know out there um, that you are actually doing some work in this, in this area. You can see what other folks are doing work in areas that are of interest to you and, and of interest to your team as you're going forward. They also have a setup for you to be able to search using mesh term headings, um, and they have a way that you can be able to create an account as well to be able to search and see what sort of, um, or to be able to upload your own protocols, which is something Alex is going to talk about in just a little bit. Um, the Joanna Briggs Institute, or JBI, um, has systematic reviews that are available that you can search that are through J, or have been done through JBI. I mean, I've got a link here, and I'll, I'll note, I'm going to note with Joanna Briggs and a couple that are after this. Um, these links are UA library links. Um, so the ones that I, I'm noting that for, so JBI is one. Um, whenever you select that, that link, it is going to request that you put in your my Bama username and password to be able to log in to ensure you've got full access. Um, the last one on this particular slide is Open Science Framework. So Open Science Framework goes beyond um, just things that, that co coincide with, with health initiatives. Um, so you can take a look it's not just limited to systematic reviews. Um, there's a lot out there. You can connect your, your Git account up, that, up to that if you would like to, um, but you can see what other research, what other data sets are out there. We'll talk a little bit more about Open Science Framework in our next session as well as we talk about developing search strategies. So one thing that I want to note, so this image that I have on the screen is from the National um, Institute of Health Research for the, the Prospero setup. So the, the image is a, a picture of a search results using the phrase or using the word orthodontia um, to see so there were five results that are listed. You can see that there's one that um, the review has been completed and published. Um, you can see what date it was registered on. You can see that there's one that the review is ongoing um, and see what date it was registered. Um, I will note that those dates are written in a European format. So if you see something, it, it was not registered in November um, 
that, that it started. It, it's from, from July. Um, but you can see what sort of things are out there. You can actually export all of these files as well to be able to, to sort them out if this is something that you want to review later. So I did want to, to mention really quickly the setup in case anyone out there is doing um, research for grants related to COVID-19. So a lot of the, the, the the groups that we just talked about and a few others that I'm going to add on here have research set up so you can see what systematic reviews are already out there um, directly related to COVID-19 studies and Prospero has a setup if you click this link it automatically applies all of the COVID-19 filters um, so you can see what um, systematic reviews have already been registered with Prospero for COVID-19 research. Um, PubMed has an incredible setup under lit COVID that I have um, linked here. Not only can you see systematic reviews out there, but you can see a lot of re um, research and data sets that have been developed. Um, COVID End is another project that is through McMaster University that has a similar setup where you can review systematic reviews that have been developed um, related to, to COVID-19, but also other data sets that are out there. And the TRIP database is one that I did not mention with the, the previous setup, but this is another one that you can search for systematic reviews. Um, there is some limit, so it does have a PICO search as well. There is some limit because there, there are some free and paid sections of the TRIP database, but TRIP also has a COVID-19 um, setup that you can search. And so you can see I have an image here listed with a, a search that was done in, in TRIP with its COVID-19 filters on. Um, it lists a set of 113 results. I have it listed to specifically mark systematic reviews there as well. So you can see which ones are there and you can get information about the systematic reviews that are ongoing for those. So databases that we have through UA that you can search for systematic reviews, um, this is not every database. There, there's a few more that, that you can search as well, but there are a couple that I wanted to highlight. Um, systematic reviews are come from the health fields originally, but there, there are several other fields, as many of you are, are joining in, that have been in, doing systematic reviews as well for a long time. So I've linked to a few here um, that I, I wanted to quickly give you some information on. And one, this is a discovery service rather than a, a database. So it's the, the UA Library Discovery Service Scout. Um, I have a link for Scout here that you can click on, but there's also a great video that Carly has created um, for searching Scout for systematic reviews that I've got a link for as well. Um, many of you are probably familiar with Web of Science, but if you're not, Web of Science is a, is a great setup to be able to search um, a citation index or multiple citation indices um, to be able to see some, some results out there. Um, Scopus operates very similarly to Web of Science and being able to search a large swath of, of citation indices um, PubMed is going to be specifically health focused, um, but that is another great place for the National Libraries of Medicine that you can start searching for systematic reviews. And I've listed Engineering Village being, being the engineering librarian. I like to I like to point some of these resources out as well. And I, I do have a, a screenshot from an Engineering Village search that I did. Now this was a very broad search, searching only for systematic reviews in general. If you were searching for a systematic review, and I should note there were about 11,870 records that I searched um, just using the Compendex database through Engineering Village that, that are listed here. Um, but I did not search for a specific subject. That was just for systematic reviews or systematic literature reviews. So I, I listed a couple of keywords down here in the bottom, and you can see these again in, in the video that Carly has provided up, up, um, further toward the top with the, the page that I've got here. But when searching for systematic reviews in any of these, um, if you were looking for, the, for reviews within medicine or within the health field, the, the keyword search that you're gonna use is whatever subject that you're looking for, and then in quotation marks, in quotation marks, systematic review. If you get outside of the, the health and medical field, you'll want to include this systematic literature review in quotation marks as well. Um, so in the engineering fields, that's often what they're called. In several other fields, they're often listed as systematic literature reviews also. Um, but we're going to talk further about actually searching some of these databases in our next session um, for next week. All right, so we're going to talk now about creating a protocol. So I'm going to talk about creating a systematic review protocol. Um, I actually volunteered to talk about this part because I think it's very important. Um, just going back to some of my own personal experience with working with this. And also what Lance was talking about is super important because one of your first steps with doing a systematic review is, A, you want to see, has there been a systematic review published on your topic? Is your idea sort of redundant? But then going beyond just searching for just published systematic reviews, searching for the systematic review protocols, because a lot of people register their protocols while they are working on it. So it's a way of just being, avoiding being blindsided by somebody working on a topic that's basically just like yours. But 
even if you do not publish your systematic review protocol, it still is a very important part of the process. Um, so what does working on a systematic review protocol do? Um, I think it does a lot of things, but I think one thing is that it really helps with the teamwork needed to do a systematic review. So one thing we didn't even talk about when we were talking about the differences between a traditional literature review and a systematic review is the team. Um, a traditional literature review can be done by one person. I, I don't know of any systematic reviews that are done by one person. In fact, you're just explicitly not supposed to do a systematic review by yourself. You're supposed to have a team of at least three people. Um, in a way that is used to reduce bias, basically, especially when you are identifying articles after you have found them, when you are choosing articles for inclusion or exclusion, a team of reviewers is meant to eliminate some bias, basically. So a systematic review protocol, I think, is very helpful for keeping all members of your team on track. Um, what does it do besides that? Well, it spells everything out the research question, your search strategies, so that there's no ambiguity or wasted effort. And like I said, I have personal experience with this. Um, I have uh, worked with a faculty member in health sciences on a systematic review. And when we were working on it, when we first started, we just, we would talked about it. We knew what the idea was. We did what's called like a scoping search, which we'll talk about next week where you go out and do kind of a quick search to see how many articles there are on the subject. And so we started out and we were doing that, but frankly, we weren't completely on the same page as far as what we were doing and what we were looking for. Um, and the systematic review protocol was a way of clearly putting everything down on paper so that we all knew exactly what the research question was, exactly what the inclusion or exclusion criteria was, exactly what the search strategy was. So we were all on the same page, basically. So I am a pretty big believer in doing this and creating one, whether you register it or not. It also finally assists with reproducibility, which is a very important part of this. So If you can go ahead to the next slide, um, we'll have an example of a systematic review protocol. There are many of these out there. Um, this is not the only one, obviously, but this is the one I have used before and I have found it very helpful. Um, again, it is a way of kind of clearly stating everything, especially if you were working, again, from personal experience, if you're working with a librarian who might be your subject expert, but isn't a subject expert on the actual subject. Um, it's a way of spelling everything out, like a, the review question and every aspect of the overall topic. Um, Lance, go ahead to the next slide and we'll talk about the rest of this. So here you were able to kind of develop your search strategy. And this is where a, a librarian can come in handy to some extent. Um, what databases to be searched? Um, if you were in the health the medicine fields and you'll be wanting to look at PubMed and CINAHL Plus and various other databases. And if you're in engineering, you'll be wanting to look at Engineering Village, Web of Science, et cetera, et cetera. Other, components of a search strategy are things like hand searching, which is just in searching important journals title by title, basically. And then doing reference searches, which are forward or backward citations. And there are all sorts of aspects of a good systematic review strategy. And then the eligibility criteria, I think is very important for a lot of reasons. And one is it can help with the actual research process. Uh, like I was saying before, if, you know, going back to if you're working with a large team, I was working on one that was about uh, diabetes and clinical outcomes. And I am, again, not an expert about diabetes or clinical outcomes. I'm an expert on finding articles about diabetes and clinical outcomes, but I'm not an expert on the actual disease. So the inclusion exclusion criteria really spelled out exactly what we were looking for. And I came back to that a lot, actually, in searching for articles because it's like, what is really important? What do we need to find? So Lance, if you could go ahead to the final page of this one. This 
you'll get into more as you go along. Um, you know, the steps of a systematic review, as Carly was pointing her out, are anything like starting with the research question, to working on the protocol, to finding articles, to selecting articles, and then eventually to things like data extraction and data synthesis. Um, so you have all the steps and you're able to kind of put everything down on paper so that everyone in your team knows what we're doing and what we're working on and what the goal of the systematic review is. And then finally, it's just very important for, um, for documentation. Um, an important part of a systematic review is you want to be as transparent as possible about what you did and how you went about searching for articles, what you searched for, how you found them, so that your study could be reduced, reproducible if necessary. And this is just another part of that overall plan. Um, so let's go ahead, Lance, to the next slide where we'll talk about registering one. Lance already talked about a good bit of this, but when, places that you can search for systematic review protocols are also, of course, places that you can register your own systematic review protocol. Um, the only thing I'll mention here, Lance went through all of them and talked about the differences between them. If you are in some areas like uh, business or um, some related subject, there may not be an obvious place to register your systematic review. If you are in health sciences, then you can register the, at Prospero or the Cochrane Registry. If you are in other science fields, then you can register at the Open Science Framework. In some areas, it may not be clear at first. Um, what I would recommend with that is contact your librarian, see if they know some places, a place that you could go to register your protocol. But then the other thing I would say is even if there isn't a great place to register your protocol, I think it's worth doing besides that um, because it's worth doing for your own project. Um, it's worth doing because it helps sort of build your search plan and your overall systematic review plan. So Lance, uh, if you could go ahead to the next slide. I think that basically wraps up what we were talking about with building a protocol. Um, we do have some resources here that you can look to. Um, some of these Carly mentioned at the very beginning, developing your research question, assembling the pieces of a systematic review. And then some of them are the last few are more about developing a systematic review protocol. And like Lance shared the link, you, you will have these slides and you will have a recording of this video so you can come back to these as you go. And then let's, let's move on to the next slide. And I believe what we will have now is just time for questions. Um, so we have hit about 1240. Um, at this point, we do have a few things just to kind of talk about at the very end, but for now we definitely have time for questions. If you would like to just unmute yourself and ask, or if you would like to share them in the chat, we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Alex, we did have a question come in on the, the chat earlier that, that came to me um, about uh, searching for COVID-19 um, reviews from a, a business impact perspective um, as opposed to a medical. Um, I'm going to I'm going to stop for just a moment and pull. We have a guide that we we put together that that is not necessarily specifically for systematic reviews, but is for searching for information regarding COVID-19 in general. Um, that is going to include information for different keywords to be able to search, as well as databases within the the, the business sizes that, that you can search um, for that. So I'm going to step away for just a moment so I can grab that and I'm going to drop that in the chat. Okay. And we will definitely get into a lot of the, the, the sort of daunting part, if there is a daunting part, which is all the things that you can do to kind of build a good, effective um, search strategy and how to find the articles that you need. We'll, we'll definitely be going very in depth on that next week. I have a quick question. Um, so my name is Katie Garrison and I'm a, a first year assistant professor in the Department of Psychology. So thank you guys first for your presentation. This is really helpful. Um, but I just have a question about what to do if you have any recommendations for if you decide that you need to change your protocol once you start. And so I've had a little bit of experience with systematic reviews. And once I started searching articles and kind of coding them, 
I like realized that the scope was too big and we had to change things. And, and from my understanding, this is kind of common just because once you sort of in, embark on this project, often things change. And so do you have recommendations for how to update your protocol um, or um, just like to keep things streamlined and organized if you have to change things uh, midway through? Does that make sense? No, definitely. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts. I'm happy to share some. Um, my, uh, for my thought with this is that uh, it, if you're registering the protocol, one thing you're doing with that is it's sort of, it's sort of just a, it's kind of courtesy in an extent because you're registering your protocol so other people can see that you're working on it so they know that you might be publishing it at some point. So there's nothing really with registering it that can keep you, that keeps you from updating it basically. You're sort of just registering it to say that you're working on this thing. I, I definitely, when we've worked on one before, we've worked on the protocol for a while. So I think it, the protocol can definitely be sort of a living document to some extent. Um, I, I, don't, I don't see any reason why you couldn't just go through and update it as you go to some extent. Um, I don't know if any of y'all have any thoughts about that. No, I think you covered what, what I was thinking, Alex. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add to that. I, I do think, like you said, it can be this document as you're going. I mean, once you really get into that in-depth research process and are accumulating more and more resources, it is possible, right, that it might shift a little bit. And so I think going into it with that flexibility at the beginning kind of stages um, happens. And um, like Alex said, just kind of seeing that as, as kind of a document that can be updated as you're going is, seems to be okay. Yeah, actually, Joy had a good point in the chat, which is that uh, people can take a look at the chat for a second. It's just that you, according to Cochrane, you, you can't go back and update the protocol. You just may explain in the paper why you made the changes, which is another thing we didn't really talk about with the protocol. But you are, in a lot of times when you're in the systematic review, you are using some of the protocol in the actual paper. You were talking about your protocol and what you did and, um, and what your plan was, what your search strategy was, and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, that if you, uh, anyone wants to take a look, Joy had a helpful answer in the chat as well. Are there any other questions? And I did add the I did the libguide um, link, um, so a guide to resources through through UA libraries for for multiple fields um, for resources on COVID nineteen. For that, that question earlier, I would say if you if you are going to search for systematic reviews specifically related to COVID nineteen in these these different fields that may venture outside of healthcare, you'll want to make sure and include as a part of your your search your keywords. Um, so. So look for the subject that you're looking for, but also include either systematic review in, in quotation marks or systematic literature review in quotation marks. But those those databases are there, and there's a great list of uh, search terms too, which again, we'll talk more about searching next week. Also, I'll point out just even piggybacking more off of the Joy's comment in the chat, which is that Cochrane has a lot of helpful information about systematic reviews, um, a lot of very helpful information about it. Um, so I, I don't know about Lance or Carly, but I, uh, no one really taught me how to do a systematic review in school. Um, so I had to sort of find out on my own to some extent, and Cochrane has been a, a very helpful resource with that. Are there any other questions? We have some time. We only, we only have a, a, a few brief sort of, um, trying to think of it, just a few brief notes about uh, our contact information and what we're planning for the next two weeks. So we, we have time for more questions if anybody has any. Tell you what, oh, I do if we had one. Lance, we would definitely, we can, anyone can pop in with a question at any point, but Lance, do you want to move on to the next slide? We could go ahead and talk about a few things and then um, anyone can share their questions at any point. Just 
unmute yourself and stop me or post in the chat. Uh, the last thing, uh, last couple of things we point out again, um, during these wet workshops, we will have three of them. Um, we would like as many people as possible to show up, but we will also be sending you the recordings. But beyond these workshops, we are available to help. Um, we don't have a, a, a detailed systematic review plan necessarily, but your liaison librarians are someone that you can go to if, if you have a question about doing a systematic review or if you need assistance, whether that's sort of small time assistance or very in-depth assistance. Um, so if you need any extra help, you can contact one of us or you can contact your liaison librarian, depending on who that is. Um, as far as our contact information, we have it right here in the slides. Um, we are also all of us all over the library's website. We are very hard not to find. Um, so you can contact any of us at any point. And as far as the next workshop goes, um, next Tuesday at the exact same time, um, we will be doing the second of our three-part workshop series, which is possibly the more interesting or important part. Or if it's if you were, if you're starting to work on a systematic review, it might be the scary part, which is how do I go about finding all published studies? that meet my inclusion criteria? What is the best way to search for articles? What databases do I use? What search strategies do I use? We will be going over all of that next week um, from 12 to one or however long it takes, um, Tuesday, October 20th. Like this one, um, you do have to register. So if you have not registered for that one, um, the link to register is included in this PowerPoint and it also is in the original email that we sent. Um, Carly and Lance, if y'all have any, do y'all have anything else to share? If not, also definitely had, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you all so much. Um, oh, it looks like we have um, one chat in the, a question in the chat. How do I know if my research question is too broad or too narrow? Um, I think one thing that you can do is, I sort of mentioned it very much in passing earlier, but there, there's something that's called, or what's at least in, maybe it's just in the library world, called a scoping search, which is one of your first parts of your systematic review. You, you first start with thinking about your topic, you write a research question, you search for other published systematic reviews to see if somebody else has written something that you were about your exact topic or is in the process of writing something about your topic. And then you do what is called a scoping search, which is, let's say you're in, uh, you're doing something in health and nutrition. You go to PubMed and maybe CINAHL Plus and maybe another database and do sort of a basic quick search for your topic. And you just do that to get a sense of how many articles are out there on your topic. If your topic is too narrow, you might know right then because you might find out, you might have a good idea like we're not going to be able to find enough published primary research articles to do a systematic review on this topic. Um, so that is one of the first early steps in searching. After that, and if you've decided you have enough articles or, or your search is viable, then you go back in with the much more systematic, detailed, comprehensive search of databases. But one of the first things is the source scoping search where you can get a sense of all right, there, there may not be enough articles on this topic. Now that doesn't really cover the, is it too broad? Um, although it could, I guess, if you just find a huge amount of articles in your topic. But also, and Carly might have an idea about this as well, but some of the, I think some of the point of the, the, some of the research question models is it sort of helps to avoid a too broad of a question. Would you agree with that or not, Carly? Yeah, I think when you use those frameworks as a guide to writing your own question, it will kind of help with um, formulating a question that is it is kind of appropriate in scope. Um, and and then once you kind of tackle that, then kind of going forward and doing those initial searches, I think those two um, those two components combined will really help in terms of. Um, figuring out or kind of coming to the conclusion of um, is it is it a, 
appropriate in scope? Um, is there too many? Is there not enough? And I think with those two things, it, they'll be really helpful in terms of kind of coming to the conclusion of, of um, scope in terms of the question. Yeah. Okay, the next question in the chat, I almost started to talk about that just based off of the last question. I almost was like, well, you know, I wonder, like, is there, because we were talking about doing the scoping search, and can you, like, what is the, what is the right amount of articles? If you go out there and you say, all right, there are only three articles on this, is that enough? From my understanding, there is not a, there is not like a, a, a number for a minimum amount of studies. But I would think from everything I've seen, and, and Lance or Carly, you might have an idea, but I, I feel like most things that I've read are you, you probably want at least, and I hate to even put a number, so maybe I shouldn't, but you probably want at least like five articles, um, something or in that general vicinity. One or two articles is probably not enough, but even that is sort of, it's dependent on the data that is included in the articles that you find? Um, can you extract enough data from the articles? So it's sort of, there's a lot of components to that question, but uh, Lance and Carly, you all, you all are welcome to join in. Um, I would say, Alex, um, and, and to, to the, the person that asked that question, um, I, again, there's, there's not a, a, a magic number, the, the, the bare minimum, um, but you want to make sure that if you do only come up with five, the, that there's a reason that you only came up with five. So, so part, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about that next week and how it is that you do your search and what it is that you're going to search, but you want to show that you have exhaustively searched the literature to, to find the, we'll say that five, the number, I guess, that, that, that five was, was all that you found and why that was the, that it was all that you found. Um, so, and, this is a this is a reproducible thing. You're you're creating a you're doing a, a scientific experiment in a way. You're going to show something that people can go behind you and, and do again. And that, that's the whole purpose of the systematic review is it is reproducible. So you want to be able to show if, if you only if your search result only yielded a, a very limited amount to be able to to say why that was um, in the in the paper in the review that you write. Definitely. I do want to reiterate that five is on the lower scale, <laughs> but you definitely don't want much less than that. But even like I was saying with that, there is some context to it. I mean, they need to be high quality studies that you're able to extract enough data from. And also, like Lance was saying, it, it needs to be if there are only seven or eight, then then there really should only be seven or eight out there. You don't need to be missing studies if you have a relatively low number. Okay, we're coming up towards one o'clock, but we definitely have a few more minutes if anyone else would like a final question. While we're waiting, I'm gonna drop a couple of links in the chat. Um, so the, the slide deck is available. Um, I, before I drop the slide deck though, I do wanna drop a link for the calendar event for the next session that we're gonna have, which again, is gonna be a week from today, Tuesday, October 20th at 12 noon central time. Um, so I'm going to drop that link for that in the chat. So you can you can click on that and be able to find the actual registration link from there and be able to add it to your calendar if you would like. Um, I'm also going to grab a link for the slide deck one more time just to make sure that folks have got it. So all of the links that you saw today um, in the presentation are linked there. So anything that you want to try back out and be able to link back out to, you can. Um, you also will, will have a, a copy of the recording that's available that you can go back and rewatch if you would like also. Um, before we go, and I'm looking to see, I don't see any blue hands raised, no comments in the chat. Alex and Carly, do you have anything else you want to add before we, before we sign out? No, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Thank you so much for um, joining us today and I hope it was helpful and yeah, we look forward to next week. Awesome, everybody. Thanks for coming. We will see you next week for basic search strategies with systematic reviews. I want to reiterate that we at UA Libraries are here for you. So at any part of this process, please feel free to contact us and we'll be glad to help out. And thanks again for coming today. And we'll, we'll follow up with a, a copy of the presentation later.